Optimize Law Firm podcast, where we talk about how to run a more profitable and enjoyable legal practice. My name is Patrick Carver, and I am the owner of Constellation Marketing. I am thrilled to be joined today by legal marketing influencer, oh, wow. Jared Correa. Wow. He, he is the CEO of Red Cave Legal. He's also the COO of Gideon, a, I guess you would call it a chatbot and document automation yeah. platform. It's pretty good. Yeah, I think okay. I'll go with that. That makes all right. sense. And also a, a prolific contributor across the internet, across a variety of uh, topics, uh, legal topics, and right. um, yeah. just an, an all around nice guy. So we're really appreciative and thanks for joining us. Oh, you're too kind. I appreciate that. Yeah, thanks for having me on. I'm excited. I'm ready to roll. <laughs> this is awesome. Yeah, we've had it kind of in the works for a while, but um, yes. And I think uh, you know what we had kind of penciled in to talk about today is uh, very uh, opportune with what's going on. Although the more I thought about it, and the topic today is going to be AI and and Chat GPT, but the more I thought about it after our initial conversation, I was kind of like, you know what? I actually have a little bit of AI fatigue right now, so I don't know if that's we what can go feeling. in another direction if you want. Like, <laughs> no, I, no, I think it's a it's a great topic. It's just yeah, my only point is, and I'm guessing you're the same way. It's like it feels like the floodgates have opened with regard to people's interest and oh, yeah. uh, in AI and and Chat GPT so far. It's funny, like I always judge technology trends on whether or not my mom has heard about it. And like my mom right. was talking to me about Chat GPT the other day, and I was like, okay, this is like officially a thing in the culture <laughs> that's crazy so, yeah yeah but like i would say for like the last three weeks or so it's like all anybody wants to talk about attorneys clients i've been on a few podcasts talking about it i'm starting to do some continuing legal education programs with bar associations and they're all like reaching out and being like can you do something on this and the and the questions have been like fast and furious i mean you know, when I do yeah. these CLE programs, which are kind of structured, you have to talk about certain things. Usually, like, people are napping while I'm talking. But, like, now with this topic, like, everybody's firing off questions, like, right from the jump. We did one the other day where we got, like, 40 questions. It was crazy. I haven't seen that in years. <laughs> so people are wow. definitely interested in that. But I feel you. Like, there's a little bit of fatigue here, for sure. Well, let's start with, like, a quick rundown of yeah. the landscape currently and how you would summarize AI and chat GPT. I think those are the really the two main buzzwords out there right now that are really kind of dominating the news yeah. and, you know, and what's, what's going on. Like, how would you kind of, you know, wrap that up into a, you know, a, a summary of what, what it all, what it's all about. So uh, I'll start with chat GPT, which is more of a specific thing. It's a type of AI. It's called generative AI. And kind of the way that works is effectively like you prompt that system with a question and it provides you an answer. And it's just that broad. It could be any type of question you want. It could be any type of task you want it to do. Like, obviously, it's not going to be able to go to the grocery store and get milk for you. But if you wanted yeah. to draft something for yeah, but yeah, that'll happen. Yeah, we can talk about robust too. But that's effectively what it is, inputs and outputs. And so you want to craft these prompts to deliver the results you want. And what's really cool is, you may be thinking like, yeah, I guess I could do that through Google, right? I could ask a query of Google and it would provide me some response. Sure. But with a tool like this, it's an intelligent AI. So it's able to converse effectively back and forth with you. So you can say, now do this, now tweak this in this way. And I think it's super helpful for a lot of things. Um, and it's only going to get better. So, but AI more generally is sort of, so artificial intelligence, meaning that it's a product, non-human Software could be hardware as well that can effectively like think on its own to a certain level. So it doesn't need to be programmed with its responses. Its responses can sort of be like built on its own. Uh, this is the kind of stuff you see in movies, for example. Like if you watch Avengers, like Age of Ultron, that's an AI gone rogue, right? And we're not right. at the gone rogue stage yet, but effectively like it is a system non-human that can act with intelligence and like in quotes now think on its own and that's a that's a broad category there's a ton of different things that could fall into that yeah but that's helpful and i think uh what it seems to me is that it, you know it's really caught captured the attention of everyone and, and uh 
you know, interest is really focused around chat GPT as opposed yeah. to AI more generally. Cause I feel like AI has been around for a while. It's in, you know, you kind of hear about it percolating, but I just feel like when chat GPT came out, it was kind of like a atomic bomb went off and, you know, yeah. it's really captivated mm-hmm. everybody and people are seeing all these different ways that they can, you know, uh, utilize it now. For whatever reason, this thing has captured the zeitgeist in a way that like AI has never done before. Like you see, like <laughs> you see, like all these Boston Dynamics dogs roaming around, like these machine dogs, and then like there's companies <laughs> in England like building like artificial humans, effectively, like these robots are going to help you around the house. And for some reason, Chat GPT is what put it over the top. Maybe because it's like super, it's simple and easy to use, and it's free. I don't know, but yeah, yeah. it's having a moment right now, without a doubt. We'll see. Yeah, how it's all, well, it's also more, I think, tangible. You know, you can it, it, it's approachable to a degree. Yes. Like, I mean, you you know, at least maybe maybe you you can, but I I don't know how to build a a robot dog. You know, that's gonna. <laughs> no, I could not. Like, I can't. Dog. I can't go and grab that. And use that tomorrow, <laughs> but it's right. you know, it's really easy to open up my my browser and type. You know, give me the uh you know the the last twenty World Series champions, and it's like you know, it's going to pop it out immediately, which is kind right. of crazy. Right, right. It's wild. What questions are you seeing most from lawyers about about AI and, and chat GPT? I'm just going to, you know, kind of use them superfluously, you know, for the rest yeah. of today, because I think most people kind of, it's largely one, one uh, knowledge set. Like di- different categories, right? So like, um, what about the ethics of using something like this? What about ownership of information and data, which is the question lawyers ask about everything, right? Mm-hmm. And then how do I how do I use it effectively? Like, can I? It's funny, like with all the bar associations I talk to, they're like, "Hey, do you have somebody in the legal space who's an expert on this topic that you could get us to talk with?" And I'm like, "I don't know if anybody's like an expert in it yet. I'm sure there are people out there. I haven't really heard." of them, at least in this space. But um, I do think like there's a lot of questions about around usability and ethics. Those are probably like the two biggest I've seen so far. Is it mostly, do you feel like these questions are coming from more on the, the operational side of, of the coin versus, because my perspective on a lot of this uh, coming out is there's these commercial applications for it with oh, for SEO sure. or social media, different things like that, or document automation, you know, for the, uh, you know, things like that. Um, do you think the first kind of wave lawyers are more interested in how they use it in their day to day as opposed to, you know, maybe how do they promote their business? Yeah. I don't think like you've got a lot of lawyers using chat GPT to perform like legal tasks. And it's not really ready for, so if you, if you ask it to perform a legal task, right, like write me an eviction notice if you're a landlord or something like that, or even if you were an attorney and you said, hey, draft me this contract type, it'll do it, but then it will have a little clause at the end that says, by the way, I'm not an attorney, and mm-hmm. if you want legal advice, you should seek a, an attorney to get that from. So I think that's probably encouraging for a lot of lawyers to know. And the other thing is that um, sometimes it just makes stuff up. So I have a friend of mine who's an ethics counsel, and he asked ChatGPT to write him a brief on an ethics issue. And because it's a generative AI, it is going to populate certain things into the AI. And if there's no source for that, it's going to make up a source. So this is one of the reasons why you don't do this for legal work necessarily. So it had like three or four citations in that brief, and they were like completely made up. Because the system's like, there should be a site here, mm-hmm. so we're going to put one in place. So what I see a lot of attorneys doing is that if they're trying to use this to get an early draft of a position statement or a settlement letter or something like that, they will say, okay, thanks for writing that. Now provide me your sources, and ChatGPT will provide sources as well. And in some cases, those items won't be sourced. So the use cases, that that's a roundabout way to say I don't see lawyers using it for substantive legal stuff right now, at least as providing an end result. Like that's something you have to finagle and tweak Mm -hmm. before you get it to an end result. As far as the kind of stuff you're talking about, yeah, like I see lawyers using it for business processes and I see lawyers using it for marketing. 
So I've got a consulting client that I just started working with who loves chat GPT. She's on there all the time. And every time we have a conversation, she's like, okay, I'm going to ask chat GPT what my pricing model should be for my law firm. Then we're going to work on the prompts. And then I want you to refine it. And I'm like, okay, this is an entirely new thing for me, but I'm game. We can do that. So pricing models, I see law firms using uh, this to develop processes like, hey, um, I need a workflow for a particular case type, or I need a workflow for this administrative task we do constantly. And ChatGPT is pretty good for that, actually. Um, and also, that's like not something you're publishing necessarily or producing for a client. So that back office stuff, there's a little less risk involved in that. And then the other thing I've seen as you alluded to before, is like business applications for marketing, for SEO. I see people start to develop content on chat GPT. So I had a friend of mine who was a legal tech executive who left his company and started his own business. And he wanted to start a consulting company uh, to begin with. So he had chat GPT write his entire website for the consulting company. He's like, all right, I'm a consultant with this uh, level of experience. These are the type of organizations I want to work with. I need you to spit out a site map for me. And then I need you to write content for each of the pages. And it did it. And he published the site like with very few edits on it. And it's actually pretty good. <laughs> so those are the two, I think, most primary use cases. Back office stuff, uh, marketing content is what lawyers are using it for right now, as far as I've seen. What are some of the tools that you've identified or you've seen out there that are showing promise so far for those type of applications, whether it's uh, on the operational or, or, you know, I guess back end versus, you know, other business functions like that, or I mean, really anything. Yeah, I think it's, uh, I think it's still pretty early days for this stuff. But um, you've got a couple companies I can think of off the top of my head. Uh, one thing I didn't mention is legal research. But mm -hmm. there are clear applications for AI and machine learning and legal research. You've got some of that that's been built out already, like Lexus and West, for example, for a long time have had this ability for lawyers to drop a uh, like a like a draft motion in their system. And it'll say, oh, OK, here are some cases you forgot. Or you could put your opponent's motion into there and they could be like, OK, here's what you can use to argue against this, which is really helpful. But there's a company called Case Text that recently came out with something called Co-Counsel which is mm -hmm. an AI aided research tool effectively. You can use chat GPT style prompts to do research and it will assist you on your research. And that could be done automatically without an attorney's involvement. And I think there's a lot of potential for that, for sure. Um, there's a company called uh, Spellbook, which is uh, a business offshoot of this company called Rally. And they do contract generation using AI. And I think that's another place where document assembly, contract generation, where AI could be really useful because all that stuff, despite the fact that lawyers think they have the magic wand and all their contracts are very special little snowflakes, like that's susceptible to logic. And taking that to the next level, it's also susceptible to AI. So I think there's a lot of promise in a couple of tools like that. Um, but those are the two that I've seen uh, like most primary right now. But I do think that now that... Uh, companies are going to start to aggressively integrate with tools like chat GPT. So you're going to see more and more of that coming out in the legal space, probably in the short term too. I guarantee you as we're talking about this, there's like hundreds of companies working on this in legal. Well, there's, I mean, almost daily, I see just truckload drops of new AI tools. And I think for the right. vast majority of them, they're basically wrappers, you know, skins on top of the chat GPT interface uh, and doing some sort of specific uh, functionality with it. But it's, I think that's right. It's like every day there. I mean, it, when you don't, we have such a powerful API, I think, and th there's a wild variety of, of variations that you can do it. It's creating all of this kind of innovation, but I mean, it's, you know, it's yeah. definitely interesting. I think the legal space is a little bit late to adopt a lot of this stuff, frankly. And so I think you're going to see more innovation moving quicker in other industries. And that's just a natural consequence, both of the fact that lawyers are late adopters of technology, so it's hard to get market share. And also the fact that um, there's ethics components related to this that attorneys are worried about. So I get both those things. You think that there's a difference in how the 
big law firms will utilize this technology opposed to your your smaller law firms uh, who are you know maybe doing more other types of law say family and criminal things like that versus big law do you think they'll utilize different parts of of technology of the ai technology yeah i would assume that the answer is probably going to be yes and it's funny i talked to a lot of smaller firms so i haven't really seen a dichotomy yet in how either is using it but i think that right now big firms are more aggressive about using ai tools and i think that'll continue mm -hmm. so for example like you see way more big firms using e-discovery which has a lot of machine learning and ai components you see a lot more big firms investing more in legal research which already has those ai and machine learning components so i think a they probably understand it better and b would more rapidly adopt it and i guess if i'm thinking of how they would use it differently one thing i could see is for the smaller firms um, consumer facing firms my suspicion is that a lot of it will be process driven back office use of ai and that'll be comfortable for them because their clients probably won't understand it anyway but looking at the big firms my suspicion is that some of that will be more visible and transparent to clients like if you're working with big companies for example that are invested in ai or ai based companies you could potentially do more with using that tool in a way that is more transparent for them now do i have a great example off the top of my head not necessarily, but I'll come up with one the next time we talk. But I would say that I could see bigger law firms making that more visible and applicable to their clients than smaller law firms would be, would be my guess. And then, you know, the, the other frank piece of this, sorry, is that like big law firms just have more money to spend on this type of technology and they're also willing to part with that money. So I could also see big firms going in the route of, hey, let's buy this off the shelf software that contain some kind of AI features or going the route of, hey, we get these tools that we can build on our own. We may have a technology department. So we're going to build out our own internal AI tools that are going to be client facing or not. I can see that happening as well. And generally speaking, smaller firms don't have the ability or bandwidth to do that. Sorry to interrupt though. Right. No, you're fine. And I, the only thing I was going to add on, on top of that is, I mean, I think there's a, uh, a cost component to it as well, that there's a clear advantage to you know, being able to plug in a, uh, a software system to do what previously could only be done by a junior associate or some somebody who's going to go in and or right. outsource that to a, a, a human-centered uh, or, or powered department somewhere else who's going to be doing those kind of, uh, you know, supplementary parts of the, the research that go into it um, that can basically be automated. Yes. Yep. And I think that's a good way to look at it. Like I kind of view it right now as an assistive technology that in some cases would take the place of a part of the work that like a legal assistant or a paralegal would do. And I don't know that AI right now is capable of performing in a way that an associate attorney would, but that's certainly possible in the future and probably likely, honestly. Do you think it could give an advantage to say, criminal lawyers who are going to be doing battle with the government as opposed to a well-financed law firm, you know, in, in terms of, and here's the, I guess the thinking is that, you know, the government may be slow to adopt that type of technology. And so even though they have the, the human resources to do an, an enormous amount of discovery and stuff like that, this could potentially give folks like that a an advantage or uh, a way to you know kind of mitigate some of that yeah you mean the same government that wants to ban tiktok unfathomably is going to start using ai unlikely <laughs> <laughs> well I, I would say like that's definitely true and i guess the way i'd look at it, it so it used to be that um smaller law firms are more agile than bigger law firms or large government entities and for a long time, there was resistance in, big, resistance in big law firms to use new technology. So that was definitely a competitive advantage for small law firms. I think over the last like five to 10 years or so, that's gone away a little bit. Mm. Big firms are being much more innovative about using technology and they're adopting it much more aggressively. The government, on the other hand, probably not so much. <laughs> I think you're right that these like departments are still going to throw people 
at the problem rather than using AI. So if I was like a solo criminal attorney or a small firm criminal attorney, I'd be jumping all over this stuff. There's probably a ton of different applications you can use either directly or software you're probably using already or familiar with that's going to be AI enabled moving forward, which is just going to be able to massively streamline what you do. I kind of, so <clears throat> the way I kind of think of this too, is like back in the day, like every movie you see with lawyers, right? There's always that scene where there's a small law firm fighting against a big law firm. And then they're like, okay, we've got a U-Haul worth of documents to review now. We're totally screwed. <laughs> like That's every lawyer movie ever. But that doesn't necessarily happen anymore because now you have tools to manage it. And yeah. I think it's going to level the playing field probably significantly. So I think you're right. It's interesting. And so let's maybe dig into the area you mentioned with kind of the business benefits to small firms with, with AI. What, yeah. you know, you talked about uh, a couple of them, but what are some other, or what are some of the areas that you feel like, you know, the one to five partner law firm, you know, that, that AI or other technology can be used in conjunction with to reduce costs, improve operational, uh, you know, capacity, different things like what, what sticks out to you is, is uh, coming up in the next, you know, few months and years that, that will make a big difference. I think I'd be using it to put together um, business process documents, HR related items and building out that part of my firm. Um, any like internal documentation that you need, uh, which could include like a data security program, for example, um, or a remote work policy, something like that. A lot of law firms struggle drafting those things from scratch, but you could use chat GPT to pump out or any AI technology that you're utilizing for that purpose to pump out a document like that and utilize it in the firm with some probably light edits. And I think that could be really helpful. Um, I talked about the research stuff. I think that's going to become really important where law firms are not necessarily spending as much time doing these thorny research projects, but they're using AI to get to the point where they have a collection of resources and then they could leverage an attorney at the point where they've got that all that research in place to make strategy decisions about a case or about how a paper is drafted. I absolutely think that's happening right now and that's going to happen even more. Um, <clears throat> another use case would be marketing. Like I, I know so many smaller law firms that have trouble like producing marketing content, right? Like sure. you know how it is like lawyers are like, Oh, I want to do a blog or I want to start a podcast or whatever. But like you can never start writing the blog because you don't have the ability to spend an hour in front of the computer drafting content. So pump that through an AI channel. Um, you got a podcast, but it's a pain to produce a podcast, right? We're on a podcast right now. It's not easy to do this, like on a weekly basis or on a biweekly basis. So you just put that out and you're not leveraging it any more than that. Like get a transcript for the podcast, drop it into an AI tool, produce seven or eight blog posts, a post about that, produce a, uh, produce a newsletter uh, promotion about that. Yeah. So many different things you could do in the context of research, marketing, back office processes. Um, and then I think the other thing is, I think the document assembly use case is kind of crazy too, because like you could be in a position where you're building documents from scratch in an intelligent way. And if you unify that with a database of your own or another template database, that can be really powerful and it becomes more accessible to people in your office. It could potentially be more accessible to clients. I'm thinking of a use case, for example, where a law firm client is chatting with an AI and being able to produce a tailored legal document for them. Um, I think also in terms of like the marketing aspect, so we've got a chat company right now, but I think there's a lot of usefulness in an AI chat as well, which is able to have more or less a conversation with someone outside of like a structured arrangement, which a chat bot would do. So I'm interested in looking at that for our product even. So I think there's so many different use cases that you could use as law firm. I just, I just dropped six off the top of my head, but there's probably hundreds. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think there's, yeah, I mean, there's just kind of an infinite number and uh, I think yeah, one opportunity I, right. I see with it as well is being able to 
Well, are you familiar with the embeds, like the embedded uh, portions of uh, open AP AIs, like API and, and kind of what people are doing with that? Yeah, absolutely. Like, I think that the more people are going to be able to integrate with technology, the more you can layer it into an existing tool. So, and I think, honestly, like, not to change the subject too much, but like, I feel like that's the way that this is going to infiltrate legal is that the tools you're using already, like the productivity software is the case management software is the CRMs. They're going to start adding AI features at a rapid pace. And yeah. then lawyers are just going to start using it as if they didn't even know. Like, I mean, Microsoft, right. Right? If, if you're drafting an email in Outlook today, it's finishing your sentences. It's suggesting yeah. language. Uh, that's an AI tool effectively. And that's only going to get more aggressively used. Yeah. Well, I, another, I think it's, yeah, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. No, I was just going to, I think I, I like, I couldn't uh, blank for a second, but the thing I was going to uh, add on top of that is, you know, in terms of interacting, if you know you're interacting with AI as a as a, an associate or in a law firm, you can use the embeds to build your own re repository of information on any topic. And so I see applications for even our team, you know, as far as writing, is that instead of sending them out onto the internet to figure out what's true or what you know, what, what's, <laughs> what's really uh, accurate about a particular law, we create our own index, our own yeah. repository. And then based on that, you're able to ask questions and get, get guided analysis, but you can, you can really verify the uh, validity of, of the information. And, uh, and so I almost see that, you know, that there's going to be law firms kind of building their own custom information cells or, or, you know, boxes that then you can, you can take advantage of. Yeah, no, I think that's a great point is that like the AI is good in a vacuum, like good in the sense that like it operates the way you expect. You can have an intelligent conversation back and forth with it, but that also depends on the data it has to A, index and B, learn on. So if you're using your own internal law firm data and you unify that with a broader data set, potentially, that could be really massively impactful for law firms. Are you seeing any tools out there that can that can bring that those two elements together? The, you know, kind of the skilled knowledge that you're contributing as an attorney versus, you know, the power of the the you know machine learning and, and automation with it. Yeah, um, not. I wouldn't say that I've seen anything super impressive as yet outside of the two I've mentioned, but I think those tools are going to be coming out. Fast and Furious. And I think like the point that you're making is well taken, which is like at this point in time and probably for the near future in terms of how lawyers are going to use AI, I think it's mostly an assistive technology. Get you to a point where a lawyer can come in and make the decisions that lawyers make. So yeah, I, I think that stuff is going to be coming quick in the near term. But like some of the some of the really massive players in the legal space, at least on the technology side, I'm, I guarantee you they're building stuff out right now, but it's not out as of yet. Right. Cause so I imagine somebody like Clio's hundred percent. Clio's got to be Clio, <laughs> Filevine, um, Lexus, Westlaw, like fast case and, uh, another big legal research company merge. I'm sure they're doing stuff with this. So like, I think yeah. over the next year, year and a half, those tools are going to be coming out quick. Is there any other legal technology that you still really value and recommend to the people that you work with um, that maybe people are sleeping on because, you know, everybody's kind of gets that shiny object syndrome with uh, <laughs> AI, but, you know, something like a, you know, calendar schedule or something that's, you know, an, an oldie, but, you know, something that still is not really I don't know, like... utilized as well as it should be. <laughs> Like the vast majority of attorneys are like, they're interested in this stuff, but in a non-business way, they're like curious about it. Okay. I was talking to an attorney the other day, for example. So Chad GPT is also good for like, um, my daughter makes all these like weird recipes around the house. And now I can tell Chad GPT, okay, I got a pickle. I've got some brown sugar and I've got a <laughs> chocolate bar. What can I make out of this? And it'll give us a recipe, which is just yes. the funniest thing in the world. Yeah. Um, so I, I don't think that, I think that the vast majority of law firms are not necessarily thinking about this heavily right now, 
and there's a ton of technology they should probably be adopting that they're not. <laughs> um, I one of them I've uh, one of them I talked with the other day with a client of mine is um, these kind of like well this is a little bit of machine learning as well, but there are these calendaring tools that sort of schedule for you and try to take advantage of your work schedule to make sure that you are being as productive as possible. They'll schedule breaks for you. They'll put in stuff for you, including like cascading deadlines. Um, Time Hero is one that okay. a lot of folks use. SkedPal, S-K-E-D Pal is another. And that's a pretty impactful tool if you're somebody who's aggressive about managing your schedule. I have one guy I work with who schedules his year out before it even starts. And he's like, okay, I got 80 hours dedicated to this. I got 30 hours dedicated to that, 20 hours dedicated to this. Intense. I got this amount of time for vacation. I could never do that. I'd be lost in the sauce really quick. But tools like that are super effective for doing that kind of thing. Um, if we're talking like non-AI, like at all, um, I get a lot of lawyers who talk to me about text expander, which they love. Like that's basically oh, a macro program. So yeah. you can you can basically like type in a word or say a yeah. word and it'll produce like a template email or a template document. Lawyers love that. And that's a really accessible tool if you're an attorney. So those are just two off the top of my head. But yeah, like <laughs> when we're talking about a world in which there are still a lot of law firms out there that use exclusively Microsoft 365, including spreadsheets to run their practice, a lot yeah. of different places you could go before you even get to AI. <laughs> <laughs> so if you were to fast forward five years, what do you think the average small law firm practice looks like? with AI, with these changes, you know, are there any big changes that you see that uh, are going to happen sooner rather than later? Five years out, I think that a lot of the tools that lawyers use regularly are going to have those AI embedded features available. And I think that it's going to be sort of like just integrated in law firms almost by osmosis. Like lawyers are just going to be using it because it's available to them and they're almost not really going to know or care that it's an AI technology, uh, particularly with like, I think Microsoft's going to go heavy on the AI and they're already Got starting to. to do it now. Uh, how could they not? Like they're, they're one of the, one of the groups that basically started open AI. So like, I feel like that stuff is going to like, I view like, <laughs> so Lawyers are so heavy into Microsoft Office, like 99% of them use it. I feel like Microsoft is the gateway drug to all new technology for lawyers. So you're going to start seeing these AI tools being developed in Microsoft, Google Workspace, then the case management softwares, then the CRMs, then the document assembly tools. And within five years, lawyers are going to be using AI regularly in their practice, whether they know it is happening or not. I think that's when it what's going to happen five years from now. And then the interesting thing beyond that, not to spin off on an entirely new topic, but like if we're talking 10 years from now, that stuff's going to be happening. And then I also think alternative business structures are going to be allowed in the US mm -hmm. where non-lawyers can own law firms and invest in law firms and practice in areas outside of the law. And it opens up a whole new can of worms because now yeah. does that traditional law firm even exist or is it swallowed up? by these hybrid entities who are definitely going to be taking advantage of AI more aggressively than a traditional law firm would. Well, and that was my kind of my, you know, part of my question or thinking of it is, you know, are there going to be, I mean, is the, you know, kind of the, the brick and mortar or, you know, law firm as we know it today going to be uh, the same? Because I, I, I'm thinking about systems like companies like Boundless or others who right. are yeah. now operating in that space of, well, we're the kind of the Gen Gen X, Gen Z. I don't even. I, I don't know. What the, are we? The, millennial? The, the post Gen, millennial? I, I, I have no <laughs> idea. But point being, you know, we want we want it all on our phone, right? All the whole process, and you know, and so I'm just curious if if it will even look like that in the future, where you have kind of your you know traditional lawyer, one person lawyer coming in and they're handling your case or does it, I mean, will people really even care, you know, and yes, there will be lawyers kind of behind the scenes doing things or orchestrating, but do they really care? I don't know. I don't think so. Like, I think modern clients don't care as much. So somebody like me, like I'm a, I'm a lawyer, like I'm licensed to practice law, but I don't. And I use lawyers from time to time. 
And I only want the lawyer accessible to me because lawyers cost money when we're making a strategic decision or when I have a question I can't get the answer to. So I think everything aside from that strategic position that the lawyer's in is either going to be automated or there's going to be some technology application that does it, or there's going to be a non-lawyer, to use a term I hate, that's going to be managing that. And lawyers are only going to come in when those high-level strategic decisions need to be made. I think that's what's going to go down, honestly. And whether that's a law firm that's like set up in an office somewhere, set up in the cloud, or whether like Walmart and Costco owns law firms and you're going in to pick up a pack of hot dogs and also getting legal services. Your um, state and will. All yeah, ex yeah, exactly. Exactly. So th that's where it's going. I think like the challenge of that is that the traditional law firm is going to have a really hard time competing with that. So yeah, I think the notion of what a law firm is, is going to be very different. And it can mean a number of different things. It can mean a traditional law firm. It can mean a hybrid law firm. It could effectively mean a law firm that's part of a big box store and nothing like we think of a traditional law firm. So it's going to be interesting. So if you're not retiring in the next 10 years, this is stuff you want to be thinking about. <laughs> it's a good time to be reading. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> well, I really appreciate your time. This was a fun chat. And I feel like we could probably do this in about a week and the entire <laughs> would chat would be 100% different. But I, you know, it's, yeah. a, it's a really cool topic that, I mean, I, I think we both obviously agree that there's you know, it's going to fundamentally change things, but maybe not just quite yet. Um, but, yeah. you know, a lot to come. And, um, you know, hopefully we can, you know, do, do this again in a few months um, as some of these to, things man. kind of get kind of get yeah. fleshed out, um, you know, and go from there because it's just all changing so, so quickly. I find it fascinating. And, you know, I Same. think what kind of what we're what we're uh, linking on to now is going to be completely different in six months. I know, man. I love talking to you, though. Thanks for having me on. <laughs> well, congrats uh, on the show. Uh, that very kind of you. And uh, where? Um, so I know you. You've you've got Gideon. Tell the tell the people, all of our uh, adoring fans, where they can find yes. you online. All right, people. Two places easiest to find me online. Uh, my consulting website is redcavelegal.com, and then the software company is gideonlegal.com. That's it. And if if you Google me, you can find some fun stuff like. Uh, I just had a client of mine. Yeah. I just had a client of mine generate AI images of me as a superhero and as like a guy in Star Wars. So if you dig deep, you can find that stuff. <laughs> Man, what else is out there? <laughs> <laughs> I shouldn't say. <laughs> well, thanks so much, and uh, we will look forward to chatting with you again soon. Thank you, sir. Take care.